I feel like my generation is mad at the younger generation. Like we look at them like they're idiots and that they're soft and that they're sensitive. But the problem with that is we made that generation. That generation was inside of us and we released it. Welcome to the Michaela Peterson podcast, episode 84. This episode is a special one because it was co-hosted by my dad, Jordan Peterson, and we spoke with Russell Peters. Russell Peters, if you don't know him, is a comedian, actor, and producer. We spoke about politically incorrect humor, stand-up, acting, travel, working during the pandemic, universally funny truths, spontaneous action, the personality of a comedian, and more. I was kind of obsessed with Russell Peters as a teenager, so this was good. This was filmed a few months ago, by the way, back in March. I just saved it until now. I have no more saved episodes from Toronto. This is the last one. If you do enjoy this, please remember to hit subscribe. This episode is brought to you by Super Speciosa, a Kratom company. Kratom is a herb related to the coffee plant. The leaves or extracts from the leaves have been used as a stimulant and a sedative. It works on opiate receptors in the brain, so it's been used to treat chronic pain, digestive ailments, and aid in withdrawal from opiate dependency. I always advocate for dietary changes to enhance mood or fix things before anything else. Diet, exercise, saunas, sleep. But if you're still having trouble and tried CBD and you felt like it isn't quite what you're looking for, or even if you like CBD, but you also want to try something else, Kratom might help. Kratom can be great for energy support. Some people will use it as a substitute for coffee or as a pre-workout. Some people use it to manage stress. Super Speciosa has different strains, some to help you relax, some to give you energy. Whatever you're looking for, they have it. Super Speciosa's Kratom is reliable, third-party lab tested, and approved under the American Kratom Association's Quality Standards Program. Only natural Kratom, no other ingredients. Remember, because this works on opiate receptors, it can cause addiction if you overdo it. So do your research. But I've been someone who's come off of opiates multiple times from surgeries and wish I had known about something like this during that period of time. So look it up. And if you want to try Kratom and get 20% off, go to getsuperleaf.com, enter code MP for 20% off. That's getsuperleaf.com slash MP, code MP. They're also linked below. Enjoy this episode. Russell Peters and Jordan Peterson, you're welcome. Russell Peters, welcome to the podcast. Well, hello, Michaela and Jordan. Jordan, so nice to see you. <laughs> what is the B? Berent. Berent. Wow. Yes, it means bear. You know, no. in Ontario. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, it's Norwegian. My great grandfather, who built a boat and sailed it to North America, was named Berent. Oh wow. Yes. You so, know but uh, people have pronounced it as burnt my whole life, which also has a certain ring of truth to it but um barrent is good that's that's solid but burnt well have you gone back to norway ever yes although i don't know if it's back exactly well i mean just to go visit the motherland your motherland <laughs> yes yes i i was there a couple of years ago um, i've been there many times are you popular there it's ironically yes <laughs> You seem to be popular everywhere. I mean, I'm trying. I mean, I'm, the, the, the goal for me is to maintain it. Yes. How's that been with COVID and not being able to tour? Well, I'm touring right now. Yeah. I'm touring at, like, there's only three states really you can go to at the moment. So Florida, Georgia, and Texas. So where are you right now? I'm in Atlanta. Do they limit the number of people in there? Is it still fun to do? Yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, there's a, the maximum is 150 people in the club, but that's fine. I mean, as long as there's people and they're laughing, I don't really care how many there are. I've done shows back in the day where there was like three people in the audience. So, you know, anything over three is good. I've done academic lectures like that too. Right. Yeah, sometimes where there, there are more panel members than there are audience members. Yeah, that's all. So you got to deal with all that other stuff. I just what? have to... <laughs> what sort of panel. stuff do you mean? You, you got to deal with the panel members and the board. Everybody else wants to come out and watch you. And then, and you're like, well, I'm not here for you guys. I'm here for those guys. And yeah. That's rough you. when there aren't any of those guys. <laughs> well, there will be. 
as soon as life gets back to normal, you'll have plenty of those guys. So you're you're in little clubs, you, and that's a. But you're often in stadiums. Like, which do you like better? I mean, <clears throat> the clubs is like being in the gym. You know, when you it's like a fighter. If you're if you're training for a fight, you're in your dirty little gym and you're working out every day and you're sparring with guys and doing what you got to do. And then when you're ready, you take it to the big stage. Right. I saw Louis C.K. in a little club in New York when he was right. polishing an act a couple of years ago, and. Yeah, so I, I knew of that that training regimen, so to speak. I miss him. He's back. He's uh, you saw him at the Comedy Cellar, probably. Yes, yeah, that's right. In the Village, yeah, that's where we all came up together. Me, Louis, um, everybody, Chappelle. We all came up through that club too. Back in the mid '90s, I would go there. I don't even know how I got on. I didn't realize it was a tough club to get in and on stage from because at the time it was. We were all coming up, so like, yeah, he's with us. He's good. Throw him on. I'm like, okay, cool. That's handy. Yeah, it's very handy. Well, none of us realized we were going to be, when well, none of us realized we were going to make it, we all were just doing this because it's what we wanted to do. How did you get started in comedy? Like, how did you decide, I want to be a comedian? That seems like something that nobody can achieve. Well, for me, it was, I didn't want to work for anybody. I was just genuinely, this is the real answer. I'm genuinely a lazy person. Yeah. So I didn't know, is it that you didn't want to work or that you didn't want to work for anybody? A bit of both. Or both. A bit of, a bit both. of both. A bit of both. I have a problem with authority. So, and I, I think, um, I think you can understand that. <laughs> we, we, we question things. We're critical thinkers. We don't just accept the information. I need to challenge it to make sure that this is not false information or, or one-sided. So especially when it comes to authority in those little low life, not low life, but those places where they don't really have authority, but they're using some sort of authority against you. I was never good with that. I used to work at Aldo shoes at young and bluer back in the early nineties. And, uh, the, the district manager didn't like me. So he would always make me do really annoying things like here, change the shelf right there. Like that, just really tedious, annoying things. And one time I was really sick and he was like, do it. And I'm like, I was doing it really slow because I was tired and sick. And he's like, well, what's wrong with you? And I was like, just, I, got, I told him, can you swear on this podcast? Yes. Yeah, get the fuck away from me, bro. <laughs> and he was like, I'm your supervisor. I don't give a shit who you are. I'm sick. I don't feel good. Leave me alone. And then they hired a new manager and then he had told the new manager to break my balls. And then ultimately I lost the job because I came in late. I got a speeding ticket on Lakeshore and he, the manager was like, why are you late? And I said, I showed him the speeding ticket. He goes, this isn't a good enough answer. And I grabbed him and I threw him against the wall and I punched him in the stomach and I left. <laughs> hmm. So well, that, that's dramatic. I mean, you know, I was just, I just gotten a ticket and I was irritated already. I didn't have money. <laughs> you know, I don't have money and now I'm negative money because I got this ticket and I got this guy being a jerk about it. I'm like, this is not going to work. So you don't score very high on agreeability, agreeableness. I think as I get older, I do, but I have to respect the person giving me that, those ideas. Mike Gordon is a guy who I respect the hell out of. You could tell me that the sky's purple and I'd probably believe it. I'd be like, you know what? I think he's right. He could, he's onto something here. Well, it is purple sometimes when the sun sets. It's true. They're definitely but there we go. We established that right away. <laughs> so... What's the significance of your hat? Oh, I just didn't want to do my hair. <laughs> and, uh, but it's very attractive and your hair as well. It's, uh, I, got, I got a show later and I didn't want to do it early. So I was going to do it after I, I did this. And then uh, this is my, I do, I do jujitsu and this is my teacher's school. So. so I have a question for you, a burning question. I watched one of your comedy specials. I think it was from London. I believe so. It was in a big auditorium, big arena. Mm -hmm. I mean, you had tens of thousands of people in there, which I thought, first of all, I thought that was remarkable that you could pack a whole arena. Mm -hmm. And so I want to talk a little bit about that. But what I found so fascinating was that like, your audience was obviously multicultural. Mm -hmm. Um, and you were insulting one racial or ethnic group after another, and you could feel the hunger in the air, even through the television screen, for each race or ethnic group waiting with bated breath for their turn to be insulted. Yes. And so what do you make of that? And how the hell do you get away with it? Well, I think it's because I touch on things that when I talk about a certain group of people, 
I'm talking about it from their perspective, not my perspective. So the way they read it as they read it as this guy actually understands us. We can't be offended because he just said something only we should know about ourselves, which means he's either an insider or he's really paid a lot of attention to us. So one way or the other, they know it's done as a tribute as opposed to making fun of. And when you call people out on certain things like that, they're like, wow, how did he know that? Okay. We can trust this guy. Okay. So then how do you know that you have a network of informers like embedded no. in racial groups all around the world? No, I, when I travel around, I just pay attention. I, I like to go to malls when I, well, not, not as much now because, uh, you know, I, I think I've been to most of the places at least once or twice already. So I'm pretty familiar with the lay of the land, but if I feel like something's different in the air, I'll definitely go out and investigate what's happening out there. I ask local people that, uh, like just really simple questions, you know, what do these people do here? How are these people treated? Who looks at people who looks at who is lower and who looks at people as higher. And, you know, and then you figure it out from there. I, I, I determine which way I'm going to go with this. Like I was in, I was in, uh, um, Berlin a couple of years ago doing shows. I'd never been to Berlin before. I'd never been to Germany before. And, uh, I noticed, so I got on stage and I said, it's so good to be here in, in Berlin. I tried your local cuisine last night. I had no clue you guys were Turkish because <laughs> they got Turkish food everywhere. I enjoyed the new great German kebab. It was fantastic. <laughs> they want to see you go and see what's really going on. They don't want, they don't want you to come in and be like, oh, that was 20 years ago. Get, get with the times, you know? Yeah, well, there's nothing worse than an outdated comic. Well, it's true. I mean, that, that you have to be us. on the cutting edge. It can happen to you at any time, though, as a comic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I also think it seemed to me that, you know, you're giving people credit by assuming that they can laugh at themselves, right? I mean, that's the hallmark of a pretty well-developed character, the ability to laugh at yourself. And I, I had ex some experience with this when I first became reasonably well-known, people noted the similarity of my voice to the voice of Kermit the Frog. And I saw it three or four times and I thought, oh my God, that, I hope that's not true. And then I went and listened to Kermit the Frog and I thought, oh my God, I sound exactly like Kermit the Frog. You know what? I've never put that together, but now that you've said it, I just pictured Kermit talking. <laughs> yes, it's really terrible. And the guy who plays Saul on uh, Better Call Saul. Oh, um, Dave, Bob, Bob Odenkirk? Yes, apparently I sound like him too. But anyways, many people made much of my similarity with Kermit. And then there was a whole Peppy the Frog thing and m hundreds of memes. And um, they were good hearted. But I, I, I noticed that there was a testing behind it. You know, if you make fun of someone and they react badly to it, then then you've you've got some insight into the negative parts of their character. And if you make fun of them and you allow them to laugh at themselves, then you're speaking to the part of them that can transcend their own prejudice and their own narrow mindedness. And I really felt that in the audit in the in the auditorium, that it was such a relief for your audience to be a place where everybody could make fun of everyone else and no one had to be afraid about it. And it was it was all capped off by that strange phenomenon that seems so distinctly human, that capacity to laugh, which is completely incomprehensible. Well, for me, <clears throat> you know, right away when you talk to somebody by their body language, the tone of their voice and the way they look at you, like I've been doing this for 32 years now. So for me, it's when I talk to them, I can gauge which way they're taking this information. And then I could see if they're about, if they want to go left on you and you're like, no, 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 just stay with me. I got you. I can, I can ring them back in, but sometimes you, you know, get guys it's usually younger guys that have a bit of an attitude about it. They, they think they're cool and they also think they know things. And that's when I, that's when my fatherly instinct kicks in. I go, shut up, kid. Listen, I'm talking right now, you know? Were you, were you always funny? Not peculiar, but ha ha funny. I was you know. both. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Like, were you a class clown? No, the class clown is the loud popular kid. He's kind of the jerk. The comedian is the one sitting at the back of the class, elbowing the guy beside him going, look at this fucking idiot. You know, the class clown will do whatever it takes to get a laugh. He'll put on a skirt, but he's usually the popular guy, which is why everyone's laughing. 
comedians the one making fun of them. I was not as popular as the class clowns and and the class clowns were never funny to me. I was, I was like, Oh, you suck, dude. You know? And it would be the guy beside me who would, who would enjoy it. Or the, or, you know, there was some girls that were really smart beside me too, who would, who would understand my, my way of looking at it. I've heard, this is just something that I want to throw out before I forget about it. I've heard you're, you have some sort of micro dosing business. Yeah. I'm the CCO of, uh, of a micro dosing company in K out of Toronto red light Holland. So we're, we're, um, we've got, it's legal now in, in the Netherlands and it's about to be legal in, in Canada. It's also about to be legal. It's about to be legal in uh, some of the States. So we're getting ready for this little boom and it's, it's good for many, many things. I can't make any medical claims on it, but it's been known to help people treat people with depression, PTSD. It's definitely a mood enhancer. It's definitely not a downer. Um, sadly, I have yet to try it. <laughs> you have yet to try I've yet it. to try it because I can't get it. I have to go to the Netherlands to give it a shot, you know, but, um, soon enough, um, Joe Rogan. And this is micro microdosing with what? Mushrooms. Hmm. Yeah. And that you said that's about to become legal in Canada. I think it's not far away. I would say somewhere in the next couple of years, it should become legal. There are, there are companies now. I know that there's a company in, in BC that it's, it's somewhat legal or it's not that illegal something to, to microdose. So there are yeah. companies I've seen that will say, this is for microdosing, but here's three grams, which. Right. It's up to you. I mean, I mean, it, you look, it's, it's kind of like drinking, you know, we suggest you have one drink, but you know, people are sometimes going to abuse it. But I think hopefully we, we get past that because I don't think it, it really is meant to help you on a day-to-day -day basis. It's uh, almost, uh, I guess, in the essence, uh, almost like a multivitamin, you know, but on a much higher level. I think it'll be good for investing. I know yeah. that when, when we took off here. Definitely good for investing. Yeah. And so I've, I've been keeping an eye on these things. So I was interested I to see that. You want to be involved, know. Jordan? Um, I hesitate to say yes. I mean, you know, well, I'll... I'll I'll give you the guy's information and you can contact him if you choose to. <laughs> well, I haven't been in serious trouble with the media for About three <laughs> days, I think. So it's probably time to do something that'll... What do they come at you for? Jesus, I, I don't know, really. I mean, I, I expected the attention around me to, to dissipate three or four years ago. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, it it doesn't stop and i can't figure it out really i think i think maybe it's because the media types i mean some of them have supported me don't get me wrong but they can't really figure me out because what i'm doing isn't really political it's psychological and i am a clinical psychologist i've been writing these books to help people there's other reasons as well they have to make everything political and i don't quite fit that mold and so i don't think they know what to do with me and yeah, they want to put you in a box yes and then bury the box yeah. and then burn the ground and then salt the earth <laughs> they want they want you to say i'm left or i'm right and you're like listen i'm neither i'm watching both sides and making my own decisions <laughs> that's how i see you i don't know if that's true or not but i see you in a very similar not that i'm we're on equal footing but i see you in the same way i see things it's not i'm no i don't pick a team here I'm just watching both sides and trying to figure out where the fuck is the truth. Well, I hope that that's what I'm doing. That's how I read it. So Thank you. I appreciate that. If they're not getting that, that means they're not smart enough to get you that therefore they shouldn't be got. Well, it's, it's, yeah, it's been a great mystery and it's all come up again this week. So, um, I don't know what to say about it exactly. It's, um, stressful. Yes, it However. is. It is stressful. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, the pro that their problem with you is that you're very articulate and you enunciate well, and they can't handle that because they're trying to push you into a corner to make you uh, to sweat and hopefully hope that you fall apart. And I'm like, it's not a facade, guys. That's really who this guy is. You're not going to. Uh, that might actually be part of the problem. They might yeah. have been reading things or even listening to lectures and they're like, well, maybe he's got that memorized. Maybe this is somewhat of a facade. 
I think that could be part of it. I'll get to the real thing, and then when it doesn't appear, it makes them angry. Maybe. Yeah, I don't. Th- well, I, I, we we Northern Albertans are known for enunciation skills. You know, you're from Northern Alberta. Yes, I, I, I no am. Clue where you were from, to be honest. I, I thought you were a Toronto guy. No, 350 miles northwest of Edmonton in a little town called Fairview. I know Fairview. There was a gig there back in the day. No, I no really? Fairview. 26 years ago, I did a show in Fairview, and I remember going, what the fuck is this place? It was like, well, there was a hockey arena there. And, yes. And the hotel was part of the hockey arena. And it had no windows. It literally looked like this room was just like cement walls. I was like, Am I in jail? And it was freezing. <laughs> yes, it's freezing. It's very cold there. Yeah. It's very cold in Canada, obviously, but that's yes. a particularly cold part of Canada. Yes. I, I know exactly sure. where you're from. Where there was a, a comic back in the day, maybe around, maybe around 96, 97, a comic named Monty Cohen died out there. He was, I think he was going for a run or something and he got hit by a truck. <laughs> hmm. And I was, it was all bad because I remember I had lent him uh, these VHS tapes of, I used to be a big Kiss fan when I was a kid. And I mm, that's these, embarrassing. I used to, I used to, I found these really cool VHS Kiss tapes and I lent them to him and then he died. And I was like, damn it. How am I going to get my Kiss tapes back? <laughs> Actually, I listened to Kiss when I was 13. I have to admit it. Yeah, how old are you now? 58. Oh, so you got seven years on me? I thought you were younger than that. You're you're so youthful looking. I mean, it's the brown. <laughs> I'm, I'll be 51 this year. Hmm. So you're not in Canada anymore. You relocated to the States a yes, while ago. 15 years ago. But day by day, I consider moving back home. Every day, I'm like, you know what? I don't see the purpose of being here anymore. Where are you located? I'm in Vegas and, and Los Angeles. Oh, you're in Vegas. You live in Vegas? Yeah, I've been there for 14 years. That's That must be a trip. I mean, at first, you know, when, when, I, was, when I first moved out there and I was in my late 30s, it was great, you know. You're, you're a young guy, you, got, you suddenly got money, you got no dependents. You can have a blast in Vegas at that time. But as you get older, you're like, oh, this is not for me anymore. And, uh, and you know, my kids are both in Los Angeles, so I have to spend some time there to see them all the time. I think that's really the only thing stopping me from moving back to Canada are my kids because I have two different baby mamas because I'm an idiot. And uh, one, I think, would let my daughter go, but the other one will not let my son go. That's, that's, a, different, that's a different pot of shit on its own, so... I like LA. Uh, I've been there many times. I like LA. Yeah, I've seen you on but Rogan. I think, what's that? I've seen you on Joe Rogan's podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have some friends out in LA that I visit quite frequently. So, um, but it, there are some advantages to living in Canada. Uh, I think it's the advantage it being, it being Canada. That's the advantage. <laughs> I, it's funny to me when I hear all the Americans go, we're not turning into a socialist country. It's socialism. And I'm like, it's really not that bad guys. It's really not that bad. guys. <laughs> you see how your teeth are crooked and your, your spine is broken. Well, that wouldn't be like that in Canada because we're socialist assholes <laughs> and the taxes are like, it's like the same now. I mean, at least in Canada, you pay high taxes, you get something for it. You get better roads and you get healthcare over here. You get nothing. You might just get shot. That's about it. I'm ready to move somewhere warmer. I thought Texas is looking pretty nice. Texas is pretty cool, though. I do like Texas. I do. Uh, you're not wrong, Michaela. So you're, you're, how has your comedy changed and shifted over the years? I think it's become a little bit more uh, introspective. I don't think the set that I'm doing right now is as introspective as, a, as the last one was, but um, it's, an, it's a work in progress right now. I don't know. I'm trying to figure out how to uh, word this one the right way, because I don't, I want to toe the line, you know? And I, I, cause when you're towing the line, somebody's bound to get offended or take it the wrong way. But I want to make it so that if you take it the wrong way, I could show you why you're wrong. So I'm figuring out the wording at the moment, but you know, I'm, I'm trying to cover subjects about, you know, it's, we're part of you and I are part of the generation that, 
I, I say that I feel like my generation is mad at the younger generation. Like we look at them like they're idiots and that they're soft and that they're sensitive. But the problem with that is we made that generation. That generation was inside of us and we released it. So <laughs> I'm trying to figure out the wording behind all of this. Cause I want to make it, you know, I want to make it that, you know, you understand that I'm, I recognize that we're mad at you, but I also recognize that I can't stop myself from being mad at you. <laughs> well, I think every generation tends to think that the up and coming generation is softer. Absolutely. We uh, listen, my parents, I know my parents thought the same thing. And I, I bring that up as well. You know, my, I, every time I, I said, you know, my dad, when he would hit me, he would tell me how much less of a beating this was than he got. <laughs> so I always like to go the extra mile and make it extra goofy. I said, my dad tell me, you're lucky this is all you're getting. Your grandfather threw a leopard at me. Like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Where'd he get a leopard? It was India. They were everywhere. <laughs> Have you had to tone things down in comedy? Because I like there's a people. Are, well, People are all stressed out anyway because of this whole COVID situation. But um, some comedians have been have been somewhat destroyed. And you tell like you're really funny, but you you veer into well, I would say like a lot of race jokes. And you described them earlier. They're funny, and maybe it's because you cater to the people you're you're joking about. But how have you managed? One, how have you managed to? I guess get away with doing that, especially with media. And yeah, that's the main question. Well, <clears throat> I'm kind of, the beauty for me is that my audience is loyally my audience. So the people that are getting offended would never have bought a ticket to see me to begin with. So I can't cater to the, to the hater. I got to cater to the people that are going to, that enjoy you and, and want to see what you do. It's like if your dad just started to change his tune all of a sudden because he got influenced by the people telling him he should watch what he says, you know, that would, that would make you untrue to yourself and untrue to your people. And then you'll have literally nobody because the haters aren't going to accept you ever. And the people that want to hear what you have to say, you've just turned your back on them. So I got to stay true to who I am. And I always know my intent when I'm saying things, I know that my intent is never to offend or, or hurt anybody's feelings. My intent is only to make you laugh. And if you get offended by something I said, then you've got your own personal issues you're working with. I just happen to trigger them and make you realize that this is a problem for you. And maybe you need to go see a, a psychologist. Well, I think part of the reason I get away with offering people advice, let's say, is because I try to include myself in the group of people to whom I'm offering advice. Right. I'm always thinking of the ways that I don't live up to my own expectations. And I think that, and I think that's genuine. I don't think it's a front. Um, I think that, you know, you make no shortage of jokes about your own ethnic group and you're always part, you're always the butt of your jokes as well as the person who's telling them. And so the audience can tell that right away. It's obvious that you're not telling jokes from a position of superiority it's more like well look guys you know we're all idiots um yes we are each idiots in our own particular ways ethnicity included and here's some of the foibles but you know let's not forget that it's universal truth that we're all fools yeah i, I think that's i mean that's basically how i approach it because yeah, I'm, I, in my head there's nobody above and there's nobody below we're all on the same playing field um you know, there's people you admire and then there's, and then there's people that whatever, but to me, it's all literally, we're all on the exact same playing field. I talk to, you know, I talk to Kings and Queens and, and, and world leaders. And I talk to them the exact same way. I talk to my friends, maybe a little bit more respectful, but I don't fawn over them. So to speak, I'm not like, yes, sir. Oh, what can I do? I'm like, Oh, shut the fuck up. Listen, dude. Um, you know, I, I have, I have some, uh, you know, I'm friends with, the King of Jordan. And when him and I talk, it's like two guys talking. It's not like, sir, how are you? Oh, have you been, have you been pleased? Sir? You know, it's none of that. It's just like, Hey, Ab, what's going on, buddy? You know, it's, it's really cool to have these kinds of, to be able to be privileged enough to, to get to have the, to be put in these situations. And then it's even more of a privilege to be able to act normal with them. Well, it's one of the advantages to being, I would say an artist, 
although comedians are funny forms of artists, but I still think you belong in that category. You're sort of outside the traditional hierarchies. I mean, artists are always outside the traditional hierarchies. That gives you a kind of freedom that no one else has. It, I mean, it means also that you have a very risky lifestyle. Yeah. I mean, for every... I can't imagine how many failed comics there are for every successful one, but it has to be hundreds and perhaps thousands. I don't imagine that there's more than maybe 40 people, 50 people in North America at any time making a living as a as a comic. Maybe it's more than that, but it wouldn't be it wouldn't be a lot more. Yeah, well, you know, the thing is there's a lot of comics that never made it that are a hundred times funnier than most of us that did make it. But for whatever reason, they just never made it. The, uh, something about them didn't click. And I don't understand it because there's so many guys that are a hundred times funnier than myself or any of the top guys that you've seen. There's guys that have brilliant minds, but they, I, th they might be their own worst enemy. You know, they might just shun, um, victory, so to speak. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's similar to inventing a new product in some sense. Not only does the product have to f work, but you have to be able to sell it and you have to time the market. And so you have to be the voice for the times. And if you are, well, that's not exactly your doing. It's something that's your good fortune, but it can easily not happen to people. I mean, there's also, <laughs> there's an endless number of ways not to be successful. Oh yes, I'm fully aware of those. Yeah, especially at the pinnacles of success, you know, and, and uh, how, do you, has there ever been a comedian that's had larger crowds than you? Oh, now there's a bunch of them, but I mean, I was the first guy to do, um, arenas and stadiums on a consistent basis. Um, and I can still, um, say that I'm still one of the only guys who still does arenas and stadiums without being mainstream popular in, in that I don't have a TV show. I've not, I don't have a bunch of movies behind me. I'm not known as an actor or a movie star. I'm known as a comic. Um, I mean, Kevin Hart always sells out arenas and stadiums, but he's a big movie star. He's got over a hundred million followers on Instagram. So I don't even have a million followers on Instagram yet. And people like mock me and I'm like, what is it? I don't care. I'm a girl. That's a desperate plea, by the way, from a Canadian comedian for more Instagram followers. So I just, you people out there who are watching and listening to have some pity and sign up. It's free. God damn it. <laughs> How do you not take something free? And then they message me. Hey, can you uh, send me a video saying hi to my dad? It's his birthday and he loves you. And I click on their page. You're not even following me. You can't do something free. <laughs> it doesn't even cost. You can mute me and follow me. <laughs> I think it's perfectly reasonable of you to charge the admission price of an Instagram uh, following for a personalized video. I, I, to say the least, I'm on Cameo too. So I can, you know. <laughs> so how old were you when you were still unknown like when did you make that transition from unknown to known so i started when i was 19 um and i started to gain a little bit of uh, traction in around 95 96 in just the toronto area you know i started doing these black comedy shows um kenny robinson started the uh, Nubian disciples of prior all black comedy Sundays <laughs> at uh, yuck yucks. And it was once a month and having grown up with from about the age of four, most 98% of my friends were black because uh, I dealt with a lot of racism in the seventies from the white kids and it wasn't a nice place to be. So I didn't hang out with them. I was like, well, I associate them with pain so I'm not going to hang out with them. They were, and it was very, it was people like, Oh, Russell, what the fuck are you talking about? It's Canada. I go, it was very ugly. It was a very, I know. So when people say racism, I know what it looks like and sounds like it. It has a tone and it has a, it has a certain bite to it. And there's a venom attached to it uh, when people say things. So I can tell when somebody's jokingly saying something, or if there's a little bit of something in that, you know, and the black, community never, ever did that to me. There was a couple of times and a couple of guys, but they were just dicks in general. So, um, but for the most part, all the guys I grew up in with were, were black. So when the black comedy show started in 95, I was like, this is my, this is my audience. Like these are my people. And when I went out, a lot of them didn't know me. And then when I started talking about things, they were like, Oh my God, this is our guy. So I got really lucky with that. And Kenny Robinson started that 26 years ago. And we were supposed to have a 25th anniversary show last year, but obviously I don't know if you guys heard, but there was this COVID thing going around. Oh yeah. This epidemic. <laughs> yeah. I've heard about that. 
it may not reach Canada. <laughs> Wouldn't that be funny if Canada was so slow, it just got there in two years? You know? <laughs> like fashion? Yeah. No, I'm, I don't know what we're doing. I haven't been, in, I haven't been home in a year, but uh, I would like to know what's going on with fashion out there. Are you guys in Alberta right now? No, we're in Toronto. Oh, okay, there you go. And where the hell and did you get that couch? <laughs> Thank you. I bought it off of Facebook Marketplace. Of, uh, a very elderly lady was selling it. it. It had been living in her garage for a very long time. You know what I thought you were going to say? A very elderly lady died on that couch. <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't know exactly what has happened on this couch. It's so, it's so retro. Like I'm, I'm fascinated by it. I'm like, was that like a 1960 something couch? It's gotta be. It might be earlier. We, uh, it, <laughs> the cushions were solid, just toxic waste. I had to, <laughs> I had to get everything restuffed. replaced, but they're nicer now. Yeah. That's... Yes. She's inordinately proud of this piece of furniture. Yeah, so like it's good of you to notice. Unhealthily proud of this couch. I mean, so I, mean I noticed the coffee table in front of you has that gold uh, trim around it as well. So that's also in tune with the couch. So I see what you're doing there, Michaela. Yeah, well, she's going for this Russian gangster, early disco, crazy cat lady aesthetic. And yeah. you should see the couch in her living room. It's yeah, from it's the 1970s. Better. It it looks, like, it looks like it was owned by uh, a Greek disco star with excess chest hair and his shirt open down to here and, you know, gold, gold necklaces dangling all the places you don't want them to be dangling. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Dangling where you dangle. It's, uh... <laughs> it was apparently untouched in a showroom for reasons that you'd it, understand if you saw it for like 40 years. Well, I think this is a good time to tell you. Your daughter told me she's changing her name to Svetlana so <laughs> to match her decor. I can just change my last name to Korakova. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. My, I mean, yeah, my husband's last name's Korakov. I just haven't taken it. Oh, he's I'm Russian. Korakova. Yeah, it's very strange because I named her after Mikhail Gorbachev and I had this house full of Russian realist art and I've been obsessed with authoritarianism, especially of the communist type. And my daughter married a Russian and my daughter, my granddaughter's first language is Russian. Hilarious. So I don't know how the hell any of that happened. Lenin as a painting fell on me when I was a kid, when I was sleeping. Wham! That's, that's what happened. And uh, just for the people listening, not John Lennon either. No, no, no not, not John, John Lennon. Lennon. Yeah. All those paintings are in storage now. My wife got sick and tired of living inside a... whatever it was we were living inside. Strange Soviet museum, I guess. And now we have light instead of darkness in the house. I uh, was engaged to a girl who was... Um, who grew up in the Soviet Union. And then she moved to America in like 90... She moved to America in 92 um, during the riots. She moved to Los Angeles and, uh, and her mom didn't know anything about anything. And there was a school that was a magnet school and she didn't know. She just thought, Oh, it was good for medical. If you want to, it's a high school that was geared towards medical, the medical field. And she sent her there, but it was in Compton during the riots. <laughs> oh man. Yes. You have to know your geography. If you're going to go, uh, go go to an american city yes yeah but it was pretty funny because she was like i didn't even notice <laughs> she was like i just came from georgia i didn't notice yeah so okay so you you started to get popular in the mid 90s you said and when did you make the transition so locally to, i was becoming to fame popular. i was becoming popular yeah. locally in toronto and uh so people would know who i was it, it just and it was strictly mostly in the black community at that time and and then I started getting interest from Indian people because they kind of uh, shut me out at the beginning. They didn't, they, you know, they were on, I'm the first guy. So they're going to be very, they, there was a lot of trepidation, uh, you know, the, the word I've said it wrong, but you know what I'm saying? Uh, they, they, they were hesitant to accept it. I think it's trepanation. What, what, you know, whatever it is. It's, oh no, that's when you get a hole yeah. hacked in <laughs> your <Trepidation>? skull. <laughs> trepidation. Yeah, it's trepidation. Okay, good. I did it right. Good. Um, so they were hesitant. So uh, they started like edging towards me, like, hmm, let's have him host this Indian culture show. And I would do it and then they would get offended because I wasn't, I wasn't like the other Indian kids. I wasn't the guy who was going to be like, hello, namaste. I didn't grow up like that. So 
don't expect me to all of a sudden know what your, what, what are, what your customs are in India are not the same as what my family's customs were in India. So India being such a big country with so many different types of people, there's not one uniform thing. So the, the, they started to this, I would either kill or bomb. There was no middle ground for it. And, uh, and then I started touring around. I started going to England a lot. And from England is where I started seeing the world. I started going to England in 95. And from England, you would get gigs. I'd be like, Hey, Russell, do you want to go to Northern Ireland this week? And I'm like, hell yeah. So I'd go Belfast and Derry. And this is at the time when the IRA were bombing uh, garbage cans in, in London and stuff. They were still very much big with what they were doing. And uh, then you would get gigs and be like, Hey, do you want to go to Belgium? Do you want to go to Denmark? And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I started going all around the world and I started really digging it. And that's when I started opening my eyes to so many different ways. And that's why I think um, very early in my career, I was exposed to so many different countries. So it wasn't like being in Toronto and meeting different cultures. I was going to these places and seeing it firsthand. So late nineties, you started to get mass audiences. Uh, no, I started gaining audience popularity when they would start coming out specifically for me at clubs, let's say around 2004 after my 2003 special had aired. And, uh, it's funny because yuck yucks so where I was working. They used to, <laughs> this is how scummy this business is. And this is no slight against them. I get it. You're running a business, but come on, don't make me feel like I'm getting something when I'm not. They were like the pay scale for a headliner was 100, 150 or 200 a show. So there was a double a or triple a, I was a triple a. Um, so I was getting $200 a show and, uh, they had booked me in the Mississauga yuck yucks and they called me into the office and said, Russell, here's, we're going to do something for you that we've never done before. We're going to give you your $200 a show. Um, but because you're selling so well, we're going to give you an extra dollar per paid customer. And I said, wow, that's really cool. They were like, is that cool? I go, that's fantastic. Sure. Great. And the ticket price was $17. Well, I get to the club. Didn't they raise the price to $20? <laughs> so they got <laughs> one, they got two. <laughs> yeah, well, then you were rolling in money at that I was point, rolling obviously. rolling in the dough. I think I pulled out eight grand for the weekend, which at the time was a lot of money. Yeah. Like, nobody's pulled this much out of Yuck Yucks. When did you start? Okay, two questions. One, when did you start getting recognized randomly on the street? And was that transition difficult from not being recognized? Because I'm sure after your special, I think I watched your special. I think everybody I knew watched your special. So right. it, there must have been a transition from being recognized everywhere from not being recognized. Well, I uh, see. The thing is, I was always like out and about. And, and uh, I don't want to say I was popular, but I would go out a lot. And I, and I was also DJing at the time back then. So I, if I wasn't doing comedy, I was DJing at a club or something. So I always knew like the club scene. And that's really the only place you could really become popular. Uh, there was no social media back then. So either you were inside or you were outside. So I knew the bouncers, the owners, the, and I didn't drink at the time. So they never, they never had to worry about me coming to their club and getting drunk and starting problems. I was, I was a sober guy until I was about 31. And, uh, so I always knew how to get into clubs free. So it kind of felt like I was already popular because I'd walk, there'd be a line. I'd walk up like, Hey, Russell, come on in. Who's with you. And I'm, and it was kind of always a cool feeling. So people saw that and then would talk to you in the club. Hey man, I saw you talking about, you know, the bouncer, what do you know? And then, and you become friends with all these different people. So when it started happening to me, it just started happening to me more and more frequently is what happened. So it never really came out of nowhere. It just built and I was honest and I'm one of those guys who loves people. So when people come and talk to me, my security guys always get annoyed because I stand and talk to a person. I don't, I don't go, thank you so much. Keep it moving. I'm like, Hey, what do you do? What's your name? And I, I genuinely want to know about the person. If you're being nice enough to come and say hi to me, the least I could do is be nice enough to have a conversation. with. Yeah. Well, it's so, it's such an unbelievable stroke of good fortune to have perfect strangers like you yeah I, that's what i say oh man it could be a lot worse oh yeah you know yeah and I, i'm not the guy you want to come up with an attitude with because i'm like oh we're gonna have a problem here pal <laughs> <laughs> you know? and so if you go out now mm -hmm. uh, 
just for a random stroll down the street, how likely are you to be recognized? In uh, California? And, well, well you gotta tell figure, us about Los different Angeles, places. In Los Angeles, there's celebrities everywhere all the time. So then it becomes who's the bigger celebrity in the room at that point. And I geek out when I see celebs sometimes. I go, holy shit, that's blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I was in Montreal. <laughs> I was in Montreal at this about 86, I guess, something yeah. like that, when I just started graduate school. So I'd just come from northern Alberta. Alberta. And uh, I was walking across Sherbrooke Street, just south of McGill University, and Pierre Trudeau walked across the crosswalk, and we were the only two people on the street. And I went, holy shit, it's Trudeau. <laughs> was he still prime minister then? No, no, he was. He, he, he wasn't at that point. But I was, you know, I know the starstruck feeling, yeah. you know, and, and that just erupted out of me in a fit of stupidity. And I've always been, you know, mortified as a consequence of it. And oh, I've, I've done. I've said the dumbest things to people. I. And, you know, the worst thing is when you get in this business and you have nobody, you literally, you're the first guy in your entire family bloodline to have ever en jumped in this business. And then you're the first Indian kid. You, you, you got all these things in your head and you don't understand how this industry works if you've never been around it. So I look at other people and how they navigate and I go, well, that's because that guy's dad was blah, blah, blah. They know how to move nice and fluidly. I stop and look at everything because I'm still stunned by the situations I'm in. And I remember years ago, it must've been 25 years ago at Montreal, just for laughs. Somebody said, Hey, that's the girl that books David Letterman. Um, and she was a very unattractive woman. Let me just say that a very unattractive woman. Like, mm. anyway, so they said, you should go be nice to her. So, you know, maybe she puts you on Letterman and I'm like, okay. And I'm only 96. I'm only been in the business seven years. I'm, you have no business talking to people less. If you've been in the business less than 10 years, you have no business doing anything that should involve that as far as I'm concerned. So we're at this midnight party and everyone's dancing and there's a free buffet and everything. And, uh, I see her at the buffet and I happen to be at the buffet and I, I know who she is, but I'm trying to play like I don't. <laughs> so I, I don't know why I thought this would be funny or clever or witty. It was none of the above. I just went, wow, you must be important. She goes, why do you say that? I said, because all the pretty girls are out there acting like idiots. <laughs> uh huh. And so did you get booked on Letterman? Never. Or did you get macaroni <laughs> dumped down your shirt? She, she goes, what? And I go, uh, I just walked away. I just walked away. What am I going to, I'm not going to defend that. <laughs> so yes, I've stuck my foot in my mouth many times. Well, you'd have to, if you're a comedian. Yeah. I mean, that's, I think part of the process. Yeah. Well, you're not going to find out what's funny until you know a bunch of things that aren't funny and you flub yeah, up a lot. I tell people that you're not going to appreciate success until you've had failure. And how do you, are you good at coping with failure? Like I've been fortunate, you know, because I haven't bombed in front of a large audience and that might be because people are willing to give me more credit than I deserve because they're, you know, they're already viewers of mine and so on. But like, I don't, I don't know if I could hack that. I, I'm not resilient in that way. And I, I, you said that when you were first starting that you bombed in, in many places. You, and you listen, with comedy, you're never above bombing. It doesn't matter who you are. Chappelle can go out and have a bad night. I mean, anybody that's the, I think that's what keeps us interested in our job is that what's tonight going to be like? We don't mm -hmm. know. People go, you're going to kill it. I go, we don't know that. Yeah. I want to kill it. I don't know that it will happen. It's up to the audience. What if I get some sort of resistance from them? Uh, last night there was some guy drunk and yelling out and and I was getting irritated by it. And, you know, I think the older I get, the more short tempered I'm getting with, with stupidity, you know, and I'm like, I'm like, shut the fuck up, dude. You know, mm -hmm. back in the day, I'm like, Hey, what's your name? What do you have? But last night I was like, enough, enough kid, enough. And uh, so, you know, that kind of threw the vibe of the show right off because they're like, Oh, is he funny tonight? Or is he angry? What's this guy's problem? You know? Right. Right. Yeah, well, it, 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 I, I have an affinity for comedians, I think partly because I hung around with a group of people when I lived in northern Alberta, and all we ever did was try to make each other laugh. And 
the the currency of our social group was laughter. If you could tell a good joke or say something funny, then you scored a point, and and it was great. I loved it, I, and maybe it was part of the culture too, a more working class culture. Yeah. But what what I did on my lecture tour, I think, was very similar to what stand up comedians do. I even attempted now and then to be funny, um, which I can be now and then. But I also had that sense of performing without a safety net. You know, it was never obvious, I think, to the audience, and it certainly wasn't obvious to me whether or not I was going to have a successful talk because I didn't know beforehand. Right. And I think that's something that's so fun about or so it's so dramatically exciting about live shows like comedy shows is there is the ever lurking threat of disaster. And for the comedian, it's like, well, you're not funny. And so then you're up there trying to be funny and you're not funny and it's painful for the audience and it's painful for you. And everyone knows that can happen. And, and part of the the thrill is is to be part of that and watch watch the potential train wreck unfold and then everyone's so happy if you are funny yeah i mean there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of variables too with comedy i remember i was doing this um show about 15 14 15 years ago it was in uh, dc and uh bono was there from u2 michael mcdonald was going to perform and i'm sitting at michael mcdonald's table with him and padma lakshmi is there and uh ashley judd and it was like this AIDS um, awareness benefit dinner thing. And I was to perform. And for some reason, the show started at eight. And for some reason, they decided they wanted to put me on first. But people are still coming in and people are talking to each other. Nobody wants to hear a comedian first. And so I'm up there doing my act and just nobody's paying attention. Nobody, like literally nobody. And I could feel my heart beating fast. I'm like, mother. I'm getting so, and I'm sweating and I'm getting, I'm, I'm really stressing out because there's all these celebrities in this room. And I'm like, this is my chance to, you know, make a splash here and nobody's paying attention. And not a flop sweat splash. Oh yeah. It, well, I could have, I did make a splash in my armpits. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so I got so mad at them. I go, well, uh, you guys have been horrible. I hope you all got AIDS. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> Did you get and any walked, attention for that? Nothing. Nobody had attention. I walked <laughs> off the stage and right out the building and into my hotel room, walked back to my hotel room. Like, I don't want to be here. Huh. So you, you seem like somebody, I'm really interested in personality, probably because I grew up with my dad as right. a dad. But um, I've always wondered with comedians, uh, I had a number of favorite ones when, when I was younger. Like, you were up there, Bill Burr. Burr, um, right. George Carlin. Carlin's he's, my favorite. He's he was so funny. Um, but I've always wondered what kind of personality these people have in common. And you come off as very disagreeable, but also volatile, <laughs> which <laughs> I, I can also identify with. But um, Dad asked a bit about recovery, like how do you get over having a a bad show? Because as a comedian, you need to be fairly resilient. So does it just not phase you? Yeah, for and very you don't long? drink. I mean, yeah. that's what comics oh, had now. that going I for them. Now, but I do now. But well, I didn't. I didn't start drinking until I was thirty one. That's that's really late. That's really delayed. Why? It just never occurred to me. Literally, it never occurred to me. I was just. I was. I'm genuinely a happy person. So I. I think my fear was always that I didn't know what I was repressing. I didn't know if I was repressing anger, sadness. Um, but it turned out the first time I got drunk that I just couldn't stop laughing. I go, am I repressing happiness? What the fuck is wrong with me? So now when I get drunk, I just laugh and make jokes. I, I just, I realize, Oh no, I'm a happy guy. This is great. This lets it out further. Oh, that's good. So you're happy temperamentally and your shadow is also happy. Yeah, which is a great place to be. <laughs> God, that's for sure. That's so fortunate. And yeah, do you, so. That, that doesn't seem to me to be something that's particularly true of comics in general, though. Well, that you they're happy. Some guys get dark and you're like, okay, I don't think this guy should drink. This is not the guy to be drinking with. You want to get drunk with the guys that are going to laugh and joke with you and, uh, and break your balls. Because that's what comics do. We have really dark, dark sense of humor. Uh, very dark senses of humor, like... Like you give us a, a, like a mass shooting 
And our reaction is the same as everyone else's. Oh my God. But then literally right after, Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh, I thought of something. Yeah. You know well, I mean? that's how our brains go. Well, how else are you going to deal with those horrible things? You yeah. know, I mean, you can tell if you've had a traumatic occurrence in your past, when you've got over it, when you can make a joke out of it. Like I listen to my daughter talk sometimes about her health trouble when she was a teenager and like she can use black humor to, to make the people that she's talking with laugh about it. And that's a sign that it, it's been dealt with. And thank God we've got humor to deal with catastrophe because what the hell else are we going to use? Yeah. I, you can rise mad. above it then. And I think that's the problem with this whole cancel culture thing is that they don't give you the opportunity to, to look at it the right way. They want you to, it, it's a very interesting place we're in because people are screaming tolerance and tolerance and you need to accept this and you need to accept that. But at the same time, if you're really preaching tolerance, then they need to accept that these people are going to need time to accept your, your wishes. Do you going to have to, we're going to have, there's going to have to be an exchange here. It can't just be, you say you do this and you accept that. And that's the way it is. And then we go, okay, okay. Well, no, that's not tolerance. Well, and be a real shame if we started, if we continue to destroy the people we have that are talented just because they make a mistake, especially well, yeah. comedians, because they're going to make a mistake They're How can you not go too far if you're always trying to get, you know, because if, if you're going to say something funny, you have to be one millimeter away from being offensive and the closer you can get to that the funnier you are and everyone knows it because they know that there you are out on a limb taking a risk you 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 want to go oh my god i can't believe that he just said that and you laugh and you think oh it's so good that he just said that because it means it's acceptable and uh, you're going to go too far sometimes and you know it's funny for me is i i'm performing here in these red states now and uh I'm not a political guy at all. Let's, I, I don't understand politics. I don't understand either side, but I, I do this joke about Donald Trump and it has nothing to do with politics. But as soon as I said, one night I was in Houston, I said, the reason I don't trust Donald Trump, these three girls got to go, fuck you. And they left. I go, you didn't even hear what I was going to say. Of course, you that's didn't. kind of a demonstration of why you didn't trust him. Yeah. Well, I said, the reason <laughs> I don't trust him is because he does this when he talks. <laughs> I don't trust people that do this because the only time you see that in your real life is when something is wrong. Like, Hey man, you got that money on me. So it's all, it's all, it's always got this negative connotation. I'm not going to finish the joke, but you get the idea. <laughs> it was, it was good while it was going, <laughs> but they didn't wait for that part. They, they you know, that's, that's the thing is, so a lot of people just jump to these conclusions because they can't seem to think that anybody else thinks differently than they do. So we're, we're breeding a whole generation of narcissists. It's not just, I swear though, <laughs> coming from the younger generation, I don't think it's just us. Now it's certainly worse at my level. And I think it gets worse the younger you get. Right. You peaking at maybe 20 or 21. Um, right. But, but people's opinions that are older have also changed. It's not like everybody who's older is, is immune to this. There are a lot of people who are older um, that are also perpetuating it. Absolutely. It's a, it's, it's a double-edged sword, but we, we, we got to live so much longer without that. And now yeah. we're getting into that. Whereas these kids are growing up with it. So it starts much younger. Um, I liken it to music, you know what I mean? And, and when, for example, I, I, I was a big hip hop head growing up. And I've produced hip hop documentaries and I'm very involved in the hip hop world, but I was part of it because it was this brand new thing. When I was a kid, it had just started and it was like, you had to discover it and you had to find it. It just wasn't readily available. And I think that's something like with the same with the punk rock scene and, and the new wave scene, everything was so new when I was a kid that we were all trying to figure it out and, and grow with it. So I always say that hip hop gave me my attitude and my, and my way of thinking and the, 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 the reason I am the being I am today. And now you got these kids that grow up and hip hop is just there. So it's not something they ever discovered. It was just there. And that's why it got watered down to what it is now. Um, and it's the same thing with the, the social media. You're going to have, you know, you got girls in their twenties now that are selling their pictures on OnlyFans for five bucks a month, uh, naked pictures of themselves. 
And then it, it's going to trickle down to like kids in their early teens now that are going to be skinning themselves out on Instagram. And that's where the parents need to step in and go, that's not, that's not the ch- that's not the kid I'm raising. Spoken like a true old man. It's true. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, look, that... you did a good job with your daughter. You know what I mean? I plan to do a good job with my daughter. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's nice. It, yes. Thank you. That's the right answer to that. It's because you don't know me very well. <laughs> I know. I mean, I can see the darkness in your eyes, but <laughs> it's not mean. It's more sees through you. <laughs> and that's why you can marry a Russian guy because they don't care. <laughs> I will take what you have and I will double down on it. <laughs> you must have spent a fair bit of time thinking about, or perhaps perhaps not, maybe you just make people laugh, but laughter's always been, always been a real mystery to me. You know, if you watch little tiny kids, even eight months or, or nine months old, they already have a sense of humor. Yes, those are natural emotions, crying and laughter. Those are really your only two genuine emotions. Yeah, and there isn't something that's obviously similar to that among animals and yet it appears really really early among human beings and and but it's really difficult to get a handle on like it the best i've been able to do is that we laugh when when we're, we have the the opportunity to sp- sort of spontaneously transcend our own limitations right you know as adults well, maybe even maybe even children see that is is when someone falls down and then gets up and they're okay, they'll laugh. Oh and yeah, I listen. People falling down is my favorite. <laughs> it's a never-ending source of humor. It is my my. I remember. I can still remember to this day, being six years old and walking home from school with my brother, and we used to have to cross this creek, and the creek was like this, and so you would run down, hop the creek, and run up. You would just use your momentum to go. And my it was 1976, so. My brother's wearing big shit kickers. Remember those, the seven, 1970s, the big heels and the big platform. Oh yeah, I was five foot two. I had six inch platform shoes, yeah, so my which I regularly had... fell off of. Yeah, absolutely. But you were five foot eight by then. Yes, and that, that, was, that was a big difference. I used to have to sit on three phone books to drive my car. How tall are you now? Oh, five two. Oh wow! Six, six yeah, it was two. really, it was really quite sad. Six two. I, oh, I'm six. Sorry, I'm six <laughs> two now. Oh, you, you're. You know what? I always pegged you as about five eight. Hey. No. That's fi- them fighting words. Small head. <laughs> A small head. <laughs> small no head. six. And six then I'm two. looking at you, and you read as tall, Michaela. So I'm like, thank you. He's got a very tall daughter for a short guy. <laughs> six two. I didn't know you were six two. Could obviously anyway. see my inner shortness. I, I, yeah, it's your shortness of breath. It's, yeah, it reminds me of a psychiatric syndrome that I coined once, uh, short fucker syndrome. Short fucker syndrome. <laughs> that is a great, that is a great term. Yeah, I'm fighting to have that included in the diagnostic manuals. You should, and get rid of Napoleon syndrome. Change. Mm-hmm. Oh, I have residual short fucker syndrome from being <laughs> tiny when I was a teenager. I was small as a kid, too. I was, I was very little in ninth and... Well, ninth grade, by grade nine, by the end of the grade nine, I had grown a little bit. But at the starting of grade nine, I was four foot 11 and 75 pounds. Oh, yeah, that's that that's uh, familiar territory, I would say. And then I had a huge spurt by grade 10 and I was somewhere around five, seven, you know, five, seven, five, eight. And then by the by grade 12, I was I'm five, 11. Now I'm like, I don't know what happened, but it all worked out in the end. <laughs> so why do you think people laugh? What do you what is it? What is it that we find funny and and? And why do we do it? I don't, I don't know why people laugh, but I know that people need to laugh. Um, it's something you really need to do for yourself. And, you know, you, I, for me, the challenge when I get on stage is when I'll look for the one person who's not laughing and I won't target them directly, but I'll be watching them in the corner of my eye and I'll see what kind of moves their body a little bit. And then I'll go down that road until I see them laugh. And then I'm like, okay, my job's done. That's hmm. a good idea. Hmm. That's a really good idea. Well, that's interesting idea. because when I'm talking to an audience, I never talk to the audience. I always pick one person. No, I don't pick. I don't pick the same person for the whole talk because that tends to make people very uncomfortable. But I'm always talking to an identifiable person whom I'm looking at, and because then I can see reflected in that person the degree to which my my words are working and I do watch, as you just pointed out, I watch the way the person moves and I watch the way their eyes are, are, are turning. And I listen to the audience as well 
because what you want, especially if you've got a grip on the audience, is for there not to be rustling and sounds. You want it yes. to be quiet. And then everyone, want- you know, everyone's focused. Yeah, yeah, and if you could see their eyes dart. The minute their eyes dart, something's gone on. What's going on here? Your eyes aren't looking at me right now. Well, what, what are you thinking about? Is it? I could see it when somebody was thinking about going to the bathroom because I'll be talking to them and then I'll notice them like, and I'm like, I'll even say to them, you got to go to the bathroom? I'm like, yeah, but I'm scared you're going to make fun of me. And I'm like, no, go to the bathroom. Jesus, I'm, I'm not, you're not a hostage. <laughs> I'm sure people appreciate that. Yeah, I, I especially do when women have to go to the bathroom because women are like, I don't want you to make fun of me. I'm like, I'm not going to make fun of you. Go to the bathroom. With a guy, it's a lot easier because I don't care about them. <laughs> women, you got to you got to be a little bit more a little bit more sensitive and a little bit more understanding. So, when you have a show, you're paying attention to the audience. I'm making assumptions, but you have a a, a body of of material sort of at hand. Mm-hmm. Now, do you have a completely prepared show or do you because you said you're paying attention to the audience members how do you how do you how do you do what you do what's your I, method I, I i come i know what i'm opening with and i know what i'm closing with okay and i know what's going to go in the middle but you got to fill an hour and opening is about five minutes closing is about five minutes and the middle is about five minutes so i've got another 45 minutes to make up for in there and uh, it'll just come to me while I'm talking to you because uh, I'll talk to you and I'll get, ask a question. It'll trigger something else, which will lead me to something else. You know, um, I had this, funny enough, I have this kid opening for me this weekend. He's, um, he was in the audience in Tampa two weeks ago. He's a big bodybuilder guy, huge, a massive human. And I walked on stage and as soon as I saw him, I go, what the fuck is that? I said, they, they, I go, when they said build that wall, they meant an actual wall, not you. And, uh, and I was making fun of him, making fun of him. And, uh, I said, what are you doing? He goes, I am bodybuilder. And I go, oh. no, no. He said, I said, I am comedian. And I go, Oh, great. This guy's being a jerk. Right. And he had an accent. And where are you from? He's from Switzerland. And I was like, but you don't look Swiss. Your skin is a little too not Swiss. And he was, well, my parents are from Turkey. And I go, okay. So I start getting into that. I go, you're not Swiss. You're the Alps, you know, I'm making fun of them about the size. And then I, I ask him again a little later. So what, what really, what do you do for them? He goes, I do comedy. And I'm like, I could see it in his face. He wasn't lying. So I said, all right, on the next show, I'm putting you on for five minutes. Cut to the next show. I put him on for five minutes. This guy kills. <laughs> and I'm like, what? So I said, Hey man, that was really good. If I'm going to be in Atlanta, if you want to come down, you can do some time on my shows. So he flew down and he's here doing shows this weekend. Um, I don't know the purpose of telling you that was, but, uh, he has an accent. What I'm thinking about, I think the reason is he has an accent, a genuine natural accent. And he's this giant bodybuilder guy. So when he's talking about Americans and talking about how fat they are and stuff, it doesn't come across as offensive. It comes across that they look at it they hear it and they go, cause he's like, well, people ask me why, why you just, how did you get so big? He goes, I put the cheeseburger down, bro. You know, it's just, he's, he's just really being frank but it's hilarious to watch because he doesn't, he knows he's being funny, but I don't think he understands why it's funny. Well, that you, you touched on something else. That's really interesting too, because co- comedians are often funniest when they're telling the truth. Yes. Right. And they, they, what comedians seem to do is to, they speak the things that the audience is thinking, but won't say, or aren't willing to say. Right. And, and I mean, that's why I suppose there were jesters in the king's court because the, the jester was a fool. And so he was beneath contempt, but that meant that he could, he could actually tell the truth. Right. And comedians are always doing that. And so I think that's actually a bellwether for the health of a society is if a society can tolerate comedians, then it's still in pretty good shape. Yeah. When they turn on us, I'm like, I don't know what's happening. Or we really get confused. Like, what are you turning on us for? Turn on the other people lying to you. Don't turn on the people telling you the truth. And like they say, the truth is like poetry and everybody hates poetry. Do you, do you feel that, I mean, do you think our society has in fact changed so that it's, I mean, so, you know, there are comedians who won't play on university campuses anymore. I know I won't. You will. I won't. I, you I, won't. I avoid them. They don't even call me anymore. So I'm pretty grateful for that, but. Um, yeah, you don't, I don't need that. I don't need to be policed by somebody who doesn't really understand the world. Okay. So you have seen that change. I've seen it change. I mean, I never had to deal with it 
on a firsthand basis. I have a lot of friends who have dealt with that. And uh, I even told my, my agent won't even entertain a, a university request. They're like, nope, no thank you. Hmm. That's so sad. How are those people going to be funny? Oh, they're going to be funny. They'll be funny elsewhere. Yeah, but they're supposed to be purposefully funny, not accidentally funny. <laughs> Who, the comics or the people? The people who aren't being exposed to the comedians. Well, I mean, it, 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 look, the, the way we look at it is it's a free world we're living in. So if you want to go see comedy, go to the club or go to a concert or something. But we're not going to bring it to you, to your house, if you're not really, if you're going to tell us how to do it. Are you as enthralled by the business as you always have been? I'm a little disenchanted with aspects of it, you know, because I think I'm a very genuine person and I'm, and I, you know, I, I try to be as real as I possibly can. And if I say I'm your friend, I'm your friend, whether you're up or you're down, it doesn't matter to me. And I tend to become friends with people after their shine is gone. So that way it doesn't look like I was there for the ride. I want it to be like, you know, like a lot of my friends are old rappers that I used to have posters of on my wall as a kid. You know, they're, they're not living that great. They don't have a lot of money, but these are guys I admired very much. And we hang out all the time. We have a great time. Uh, same thing with comics who I think are my friends, but I see how this industry is, you know, people are uh, for lack of a better term, dick writers. And, uh, I see them all patting you. They all fall. We all follow each other, but I see their page and I see who's commenting on who and who's liking. And I look on my page, like none of these guys, I go, but if something popped off tomorrow with like, I became the hot guy in the media, it was like Russell Peters. Every one of those people will be messaging me. And I'm like, I see you already. So don't let it happen to you. I, I so I, I don't ever want to be like those people. So I always tell people there's no friends in this business. Well, I suppose one of, it's a cliche in some sense, but I suppose that one of the dangers of becoming well-known is that it isn't always obvious why people are associating with you. Right. Right. I mean, I have a, you know, I have a situation in my personal life that uh, is a result of that. So, you know, <laughs> it's the reason I have a son. You know what I mean? I got, yeah, well, I got it, duped, kids. I got duped. <laughs> well, it's also not easy for you know, once you become well-known, it's it's not that surprising that people are affected by everything that comes in the aftermath of that. I mean, it really is overwhelming and 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 compelling. And so it's not like it's easy for an external observer to separate your fame from you. Right. Especially well, the if thing, they're not I mean, familiar with that world. You know, they don't know what, what you went through to get to where you are. They don't know what your uh, upbringing was. They don't know what kind of household you grew up in. I think, especially in America, because the, uh, the, uh, the Indian community in America is, is the highest, um, it is the uh, wealthiest minority group in the country. And so they all grew up uh, upper middle class to wealthy in America. It's not like in Canada where we have poor Indian people and then, you know, we, we, we have different levels of us over there. And so I think they automatically associate me with those ones over here and go, he had a privileged life. I'm like, no, my mom worked in Kmart. My dad was a chicken meat, was a meat inspector. We did not have a privileged life, you know, to us an exciting, uh, the big move for us was in 1986, my dad bought a Cutlass Sierra used from Hertz and it had air conditioning. And we were like, yo, we finally got air conditioning in the car. We didn't have it in the house, but we had it in the car. And my dad wouldn't turn it on because it would waste too much gas. <laughs> it would way... have to be a special day for him to turn that AC <laughs> on. Uh, it's way easier to look at somebody that perhaps you're jealous of and, and assume that the reason they got there is out of luck rather than hard work, because that means you don't have to put in any hard work because you couldn't get there anyway. Right. They negate you. They try to, uh, you know, they try to marginalize what it is you've accomplished. Well, and there is luck associated with it, too, as we already Absolutely. described. Is, you know, you, you're in the right place at the right time, and you could have been talented in the, at the wrong time. It happens all the time to people. So, but it's the fact that it's luck. Somebody, I think. Sorry, go ahead. It, it's, it's much easier to hate on somebody than it is to uh, show them the, the respect and love that, you, that they rightfully deserve. And your fans, uh, you sound like you're treated very well by your fans. They're always great to me. They, they're so loyal. 
Yes, and I've experienced the same thing. I'm so grateful to, for, to my viewers and listeners and readers. They're so, they've been so good to me. I can't believe it. It just, it just shocks me. And I'm, I'm hoping constantly that I don't do anything to, that would be disappointing. So. Well, that you're like me, cause you don't, you know, you want to walk the tightrope, but you don't want to disappoint. I, I get it a hundred percent what you're saying. It's getting there is one thing and then maintaining it as a whole another animal. Yes. Well, especially when all of us are deeply flawed. Oh man, I know. I know about all that. Yeah. Well, yeah. So I, I heard about a project that you're doing. I don't know whether or not this is true, but are you doing something with the comedian Just Rain? Yeah. Just Rain wrote a, a TV series. It gave us a script and then my brother and I are executive producing it. Okay. I think it's, it's for CTV or CBC, one of them. So you you haven't had a sitcom, you haven't been in movies. Um, why not? I mean, I've been in movies, just, you know, little small scenes here and there, and that's fine. Um, I initially got into this because I wanted to be an actor, and then I realized I have... I, I quite enjoy stand up a lot more. <laughs> you know, you get into a movie situation and you got to do these 12 to 14 hour days, which I'm not a fan of. And out of those 12 to 14 hour days, you may be only working four, but there you are waiting around bored to death, sitting in this wardrobe that, and you're mindless, you're, 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 you're it's, it's dizzyingly boring. And the financial reward isn't the same. It, so it's for me, it's like, Oh God, this sucks. I can't wait to get out of here and just go be free again. You feel like a, I feel like a prisoner when I'm on a movie set. Well, it's um, yes. Doing, doing a movie, acting in a movie is very much different than doing stand up comedy. Having to oh, repeat yeah. scenes too. I can't imagine having, I just get frustrated having to repeat scenes over and over and over. And well, over and everything's again. recorded out of sync. So it's not, it's not like acting in a play either. Yeah. It's not or, even yet. They may start, you know, the, the middle of the movie. Uh, start shooting at the middle and then shoot the beginning at the end and the end at the beginning. You know, you never know. They, it depends on here's where we're shooting. All these scenes are going to take place here. They're going to shoot them all in, all, uh, in that. Of course. So, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're not going to keep continually going back to the field that they were shooting in, you know, so you know, wardrobe change, this look, that look, everything. And man, there's so many people, uh, first AD wants it in. Uh, they want you on set in 15 minutes and I'm always arguing with them. Really? Cause uh, are you going to be ready for me in 15 minutes? No, we just need you standing by. I don't need to stand by. You know, it's, a, fast, it's a fascinating thing to watch. I worked as a grips assistant on a movie shoot in LA for about two weeks, weirdly enough. Which, mm -hmm. And it was fascinating. I had no idea how movies were made, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it requires a very certain type of skill. And it doesn't seem to me that there's much overlap between that and being a stand-up comedian, especially one who, who, who's spontaneous like and as you described your own your own comedy you have this massive store of material that you can draw on um i, I it seems to me it seems to me like jazz improvisation yeah it's very much the same as that you know like uh without the heroin uh <laughs> you know it's, it's coltrane without the heroin really <laughs> sometimes we just go up and well, that's how i do it i like to just just, you know, see where, see where we go. Yeah. Well, that, that, that also it. captures the audience. Cause you take them along for the ride that way. Right. So that, that's also something that's musical. Cause when I'm lecturing to an audience, I'm always paying attention to them. And I, I know where I'm going to start. And I have like eight points in mind that are like the skeleton of the lecture, you know? And yes. so I can always return to them, but then I'll go out on tangents and, and many people don't like that style of speaking, but if I'm in decent shape, I can, go out on a tangent and come back to the main story. But I can do that in concert with the audience. And then they're, and they're integrally involved in the entire process. And that's what makes the lecture come alive. And yeah. I mean, th that's, that's the beauty of it. That's also the part that keeps us as the person speaking interested because otherwise it just becomes some sort of performance art and it's just boring. You know, I, I don't want to, it's a recital at that point. And I don't want right. to feel like I'm reciting this night by night. I want you to feel like you had an individual experience with me this night. Like I saw yeah. you last weekend, the night you were talking to blah, blah, blah. And I go, oh yeah, that night. I remember that. And that, that and also talking to people spawns new ideas. Um, you know, and like you said, you go out on that tangent because you, you got triggered 
And it, and it, and it made you think of a whole nother way of looking at a situation. Yeah. It's very, it's, it's great privilege to be able to do that and to, and to have the audience there to, to, to help it along. Yeah. It's, it's fun. I, I think it, it keeps us all interested in it. Um, but sometimes, you know, I go on these tangents and they don't end up in a funny place and I'm like, Oh, well we tried guys. And then I'll go into something I know was going to work, but you know, sometimes it doesn't go the way we want it to. So what's in the future for you? I don't know. <laughs> um, That's what I get for asking a cliched question. Yeah. I mean, I, who knows what's in the future? Um, what do you want to be in the future for you? Like, what are you hoping for? Just listen to after the past year we've had, I just want what was normal again to be, you know, I don't like watching movies and seeing like a, an audience scene or like, and I'm like, remember that? I yeah. don't want that to become a memory. I want that to go back to reality. Yeah. No kidding. It's it, all those things we took for granted. Yeah. It literally. And it's just, you know, I think it's their way of ringing us back in or, you know, reining us back in. All right, guys, here, here, we're going to take these things away from you. But remember we took all, all, everything away. We're only going to take a little bit away now but they still wanted to take these things away from us. And I don't understand the purpose of it, but whatever, whatever will be, will be, I suppose. If, if that's the plan, I think it'll backfire. I mean, after the Spanish flu, didn't they have the roaring twenties? Like, it yeah. seems like we're mimicking that. Everybody's going to go like I am anyway, going to go insane after this lockdown, being an extroverted person. And be yeah. Like, I think there'll be a boom in nightlife. So if this is trying to keep us under control, I don't know if that's a good, good way to do I mean, it. We we hope it goes back. I mean, I've been, I'd, listen, Atlanta's wide open. I've been going to the cigar lounge every night after the shows. Um, oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's quite distressing to walk down queen street in Toronto right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, queen street for everybody who doesn't know is the, it's kind of the cool commercial district of Toronto. There's many of them, but it's perhaps the main one. And you walk down queen street and every fourth or fifth store is boarded up. And you think of all these people who've poured their lives into these beautiful little mm -hmm. boutiques and restaurants and, and they're all well suffering dreadfully away. And it was so good that we had them and how, God, I hope they come back. I can't see how people are making it through all of this oh, being shut of, down for so long. A lot of people aren't. Yeah. I think yeah, and, the majority of them are not making it through this. And, uh, in LA, especially it's the same thing. You drive down Ventura Boulevard and, uh, I would say one, uh, one in every three shops is closed, like done. Yeah. Well, in those little businesses, they take, they take a lot of work to open and a lot of work to maintain and a lot of capital. And it's, it, and it affects everybody on every level. It's not like, you know, the landlords uh, are taking a beating because the people renting their space can't pay their rent. And then they have to, I don't understand their purpose of forcing them out. Well, I don't know why you're forcing them out. I mean, you're not going to get any more money from them that way. You're just going to, so it, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of panic happening and I don't like to see that kind of uncontrolled panic in the world. It bothers me. Yeah. Well, it, we are in a situation where pretty much every decision that people make is a bad one. Yeah. And it's all arbitrary. So people are like, Oh, you shouldn't do this. You shouldn't do that. Well, no, they're doing it here and they're not doing it there. And you know, you're not socially distancing. Well, I'm in a place where they don't do that. You know, so do I, which, which laws do I follow right now? Do I follow where I'm at or do I follow where I'm from or where I'm going? I don't understand. Yeah. Yeah. My mom is in LA right now and I got her the shot already. So she's going to get her second shot. And I think in a couple of weeks, but then one of my friends called me from Toronto and was like, Hey, you know, when your mom comes home, she's going to have to, uh, hold up quarantine in a hotel. And I'm like, why she lives by herself. Can't she go to her house? It's like, I don't know. They're saying that she can't. And I'm like, but she lives by herself in a house. Yeah. There's nobody around her. She should be able to go to her house. And she's got the certificate saying she's been immunized. I mean, is there no fucking concession for, for things? You get, yeah, well, you get tested, you get tested to get on the plane. So you have to test negative. That I don't mind. I mean, I can get that. I understand that to a certain degree. But even if you test negative and have the vaccine, you have to quarantine for three days to get your test results in Canada. You're not allowed to leave your room. They give you a, like a, the sandwich and water. There's pictures online of this room. It's you get brought there by the police. Um, and the halls are monitored by guards. And then you go home for the rest of your 14 day quarantine quarantine, even though you have a negative test and are possibly vaccinated. 
yeah, I can't let my 80 year old mother be treated like that. I'm not going to, yeah. I'm just going to keep her until they, uh, their sanity comes back. Yeah. Well, the politicians can't keep up with the continually changing circumstances. So it's, it's very sad. So you're on a tour. You have these three States you can go to. I have these three States I can go to. And I see other dates coming up in, uh, in March, I think Utah and Indiana, something in uh, Pennsylvania. So it's, a, it's opening up slowly, but surely. Um, and I'm only taking the work because I'm going broke sitting at home. I've already had to downsize a lot. You know, I, I, I cut a lot of people off my payroll. I had to sell my, I had to sell my house and move to a smaller house. And hmm. I mean, that's not a woe is me situation. Cause it's not like I, I'm, I moved from, you know, from one house to the ghetto, you know, I'm, I, I moved from 12,000 feet, square feet to 8,000 square feet. Oh, whoop de doo You know what I mean? <laughs> so it's not like I'm suffering, but it does hurt on an, on a certain level. I worked so hard to get to that and then I have to move backwards, but you know, whatever it is, what it is. And you also start to figure out what was necessary and what was not necessary. Um, I got rid of three or four cars. I didn't need that many cars. And I realize now why the fuck was I wasting my money on all these cars? I sold some watches. I was like, I was getting rid of things. I was just like, these are things that don't matter. And I realize now what matters. And I'm like, okay, I got the one house. I got two cars. I'm good to go. Yes. And actually you need zero watches because I suspect you probably have a phone. Yeah. But I like watches. Yeah. I like watches too. I have one. So what are you wearing today there, Jordan? I am wearing an Omega. Nice. So you're, see, you're a practical guy. <laughs> Was it Omega that asked me? I was asked to be a spokesperson for Omega watches. Well, that's not a bad deal at all. Then. Me and Daniel Craig. <laughs> well, that I... happened about a year and a half ago. And I was sorely tempted to do it because it was so ridiculously cool in my estimation that it I is. was asked to be a spokesperson along with Daniel Craig. It's ridiculous. It was so ridiculous that I really wanted to do it. You didn't do it? No. I didn't you can do walk it. around and said, you're Bond, Jordan Bond. Yes. Yes. I know. I know That's what the B is for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you asked at the beginning of the show. <laughs> yes. It was one of the more surreal invitations that I've had. Yeah. That would have been a good deal. Mm -hmm. I've never been asked to promote nothing. <laughs> Not one thing have I been asked to promote. You so want to how stop, many, you want to stop the many, spread of AIDS? Give it to me to promote. No. <laughs> <laughs> how many shows do you have coming up? I got two tonight and two tomorrow and which I actually, I got to start getting ready for. Yes. We, 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 we should let you go. We're, we're very happy that you agreed to do this talk, especially. I was, I got to tell you, I was really honored to be asked to do your podcast. Uh, I told, did you see my question in your uh, Instagram? I didn't. Yeah. I got so many people yeah, are so excited. That, but did you know that I watch all of your dad's videos on YouTube? <laughs> I'm going to find that and screenshot it and save it as my, save it as my screensaver. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased as well that you're not, uh, you didn't have any qualms about appearing with me because not one that has been a problem for people. No, nope, I was my brother. I call my brother. My brother's like, he's awesome. That's amazing. <laughs> well, say hi to him for me. Oh yeah. He lives in Oakville. So he's going to see this when it comes out. Oh yes. And subscribe to Russell on Instagram, please. Yes. And YouTube. You can go to my YouTube channel. I have there. I have over a million followers. I'm happy about that. Cause that's a little bit better for me, but, uh, and then I have my new podcast coming out, uh, soon. It's called culturally canceled. Hmm. When is it starting? I've already shot. I've already recorded six episodes and, uh, I think it's going to start in March if I'm not mistaken. Ah, good luck with that. Well, let us know around March too, and I'll tweet it out and all of that. Yes. And if you find yourself in Los Angeles, I would love to have you on. That would be really fun. I, I've the, the interviews that I've enjoyed the most have always been with comedians. Yeah. I mean, I would pair us up with another comedian too. So we could, we would just make it really ridiculous. Thank you. And thank you, Jordan. Thanks for doing what you do, both of you. And, and look at this kid you raised. Well, I give yourself a pat on the back. <laughs> Hey, thanks a lot. And thanks for all the humor, man. Thank you. It, it's so much appreciated. It's so wonderful to be able to laugh. And, and take care of your health for me, please, would you? I, we need you. You can't go anywhere. We need you. Thank you, Russell. That's you very, very kind of you. Extremely necessary. Thank you, sir.
It was a pleasure meeting you. I hope we can meet in person. Absolutely. 100%. Bye, guys. 